Hello and welcome to String Zero. This is a new visual novel that just came out today. I think. Today being October the 5th. So by the time that you guys see this, it will already be out a couple of days. But yeah, I'm hoping that it comes out or that I have the videos ready by Sunday. We'll see. Anyways, I know nothing about this. I'm assuming that this guy here is going to be the protagonist. Um, I know that there is a saber tooth tiger. There's a, a tiger looking character. Um, and that's about it. That's all I know. Uh, I was following them for a while on Twitter since I first saw the tiger dude person. And that's literally all I know. So yeah, I'm going in this as blind as you are, unless you've already read it. In which case, you know, shut up. Anyways, so yeah, so, um, I guess without further ado, let us begin String Zero. Arc 1, Winter's Jazz. Chapter 1, City of Rhyme. In the moments before the world ended, I cancelled our lunch. It was a simple thing to wheel the stray notification away, a flick of mice, spectral wrist, and there it went, adrift on the wild currents of cyberspace. We had created something beautiful but terrible, a monstrous enigma growing fast beyond our control, surrounded by swirling logic and fathomless executions. I desperately attempted repair and failed. So lunch? How pointless. But as I floated in the starless sea, buoyed by the flows of information neon and endless, I watched that remnant of our history sink and unravel. I grieved for its simplicity. No more conversations over mint tea and corporate coffee than I remembered. You know, Rachel, the only sure distinction between sapiens and humanity is our ability to connect. And I realize our mistake. With no story to bind us, reality had frayed. When the line between form and fantasy became instinct, so did we. Though perception and potential approached the singularity, we had never understood each other so little. So I spun a final thread to connect us in a shared epiphany, the boundless feeling that existence was all of us, the combination of our complexities, individual strings of experience Eliminated by time, woven into an ever-moving universal tapestry, quickly becoming undone. To save it, a thousand fingers reached for freight strands to spin together, twisting in a misery of knots. When I had simply asked them to listen. Now, the ruined towers of our since-frozen city reached up towards the laden sky, hazy and impenetrable, a thousand fingers crowding a lonely hand. They claw at the clouds for as many answers, but find none. Trapped between fact and firament, soil and sky, they rust yet remain ever decaying monuments to each of our failures. Vision, ambition, genius, and promise. While the living may have lost that final thread of understanding, the desperate tale we spun from it have begun to wind up, interlacing an execution. And our idol no longer. I've made the mistake of looking down. I white knuckle the rung of this decrepit emergency ladder. My boots struggle to find the purchase against veins of ice threatening me with a nauseating drop into the centuries of rubble littering the alley below. I close my eyes and try to catch my breath in sharp, misty gasps, ragged from exertion. Wind howls between the tall buildings and through the jazzed up insulation of my jacket. I haven't been climbing for long, but it doesn't feel that way. Time here is meaningless. Peeking open one eye, I very emphatically look out and not down, tracing the skyline 
and the far silhouettes of crumbling skyscrapers. I squint through the thermal protection of my holographic mask, as if, by sheer will, I can see past the curtain of heavy clouds. It's been years since I've glimpsed a blue horizon or a starry night for more than a moment. Today hasn't changed that. I wonder. It can't have always been this way. Why would anyone choose to live in this cold? What were the ancient builders trying to accomplish? And yet, here I am. So I guess people find their reasons. I make a mental note to check my loom about it later. For now, I push aside my poor sense of local history and pull up, groaning at the ache in my arms. Times like this are when I recall that old Rayan nursery rhyme. Spinning, spinning, words like a thread. Weave them together and spare your dread. Breathing slowly, I close my eyes again to focus on what the rhyme suggests, and not the hundreds or so metal rungs I have left. Endless white and gray above, endless white and gray below, I could climb the tallest building and just see clouds and snow. A desolate expanse of bleached and muted gloom, unknowable horizons shrouded by the broom. A calming exercise though it might be, there is no replacement for skill. I sigh and cough a little as my voice croaks. No one says broom, Ravi. You just sound pretentious. I bet Dad would still like it though. He does enjoy a good abuse of language. Then I frown. That thought was a mistake. Dad. My glove hand squeezes the metal rungs. I can feel heat and bile rise from my gut, in spite of the frigid atmosphere. For a few sweet moments, I had forgotten that I was mad. Why do you have to be such an ass? I hiss at him, as if he were here. The words louder than I intended, echoed between buildings as if accusing me in turn. I had come out here to cool off, but it would apparently take more than a snowy afternoon of daredevil climbing. The echoing just reminds me of how mad I am at myself. We couldn't even keep it to ourselves this time. You're seriously joining up with Kavir, just like that? I suppose you can flaunt your talents without consequence then, without getting caught. You do remember what that would mean. It's not the sort of thing one forgets. Capture, conscription, experimentation, execution. I'm not an idiot, Dad. Sorry, Aaron, now not Dad. Well, if that's the case, you know I've never been comfortable with Dad. I insist that you start calling me Aaron. We can do away with childish sentimentality, since you're obviously a proper adult and have everything under control. Eureli, Aaron's bodyguard and my occasional instructor, simply stood there, more disapproving than usual. I didn't think that was possible, which just hurt more. I set my jaw. Whatever they think, I'm 22. I've been a proper adult for years. So what do they expect? I have to start pushing boundaries at some point. And who even says shit like that? Don't call me dad anymore because I think you're being irresponsible. I can handle myself. Uh, I like to think that I am not one to hang on to anger, but it keeps roiling in my gut. I guess no amount of exertion or a bitter chill would be keeping my head cool today. I'm just tired of feeling shitty. But like my voice against the buildings, Aaron's words echo. You know, the city isn't just frozen, it's stuck in time. Much like you are. Perhaps you're right. It is time for you to grow up and make some mistakes. Maybe then you'll figure out whatever it is that you really want what's really important. Fire burns in my core. Being tossed out would have been easier, then I'd have a more rigorous reason for being upset. Instead, I had just stormed out of our home like the child that he accused me of being, which made me all the more furious. And yet, what else was I supposed to do? The man was being an sanctimonious ass after years of telling me you have to stay, Ravi. It's too dangerous, Ravi. You can't be caught using your powers, Ravi. He dares 
me to leave. Staying would have implied that I agreed. Leaving suggests that I'm reckless. So yeah, stuck. All I ever wanted, want, is a chance to explore, to see the things and peoples and places in his stories. Maybe wanting that is reckless, sure. But which is it, Aaron? Stay and be safe by just listening to tales of your making? Or take risks and make tales of my own? I feel like he's making me choose between security and autonomy. Him or freedom. I sigh and close my eyes. I want both. Cold powder drifts down to speckle my face as metal rattles from a landing some distance above me. The wet and cold soothe my thoughts. I open my eyes. Wow, Ravi, you must really want to lose if you keep stopping for breathers. The familiar snow tiger leans over an edge. He has the colors of this place, all blues and whites and grays and stripes and spots. Mercifully, he's a lot more cheerful. Shut up, Kevier. I don't see you moving. I sputter, shaking my head clear of the powder. Doing so makes the ladder shudder and groan. I grip tighter and force myself to calm down. Kavir doesn't deserve my anger, and I don't deserve to fall to my death. I am also not the one losing. I've got the time to recline and enjoy the view. His powerful body spoons the edge of the landing with his tail flicking over the side, the most irresponsible thing that he could do. The whole platform noisily protests his considerable weight. But hey, you good? That ladder looks pretty dicey. I wouldn't have picked it. Do you hear that? That's you weighing as much as a boat. Worry about yourself. Rude. I puff and pull. If I don't hurry, he might bring the whole landing down on my head. I swear, if I die by a fat tiger ass. Besides, I thought you liked all this muscle. I don't have to look to know that he's flexing. Given he doesn't have to wear as many layers, it probably stands out impressively too. I'd like not to fall, however, so I focus on climbing. I really shouldn't have picked this ladder. Can't flatter you, busy climbing. I'm pretty sure you got enough mouth to both breathe and flatter me. Wow, now who's being rude? I'm still panting. I should have finished the climb before reflecting on my parental pain in the ass. Hey, you challenged me. And it was bold. I respect Callus' disregard for personal safety. It's how I know that you've got the grit to not fall off this ladder. I can hear him stretching, taunting, teasing. He swats the ladder with his tail and the whole thing shakes. I can feel the vibration in my wrists. Holy cow! Kavir! Language! Grumplin. But as I recall, the terms were, and I quote, If you win, I'll tell you in increasingly colorful ways how attractive I think you are. My arms ache. I'm buzzing with adrenaline. My fingers are freezing. Gloves be damned. This sucks. I am not a grumpling. Persuasion at its finest. Oh, my mistake. But fine, be that way. If you don't want this here fine company, I'll be waiting at the top, ready for your admiration. Don't make me wait too long. Pant, pant, pant. You haven't won yet. I can't hear you over the sound of winning. His voice echoes over the next floor. Fuck him and his acrobatic mastery. I laugh in spite of myself and shake the remaining snow from my head. I hadn't made that bet in good faith. I knew that I'd have to cheat. Kavir didn't need his already mountainous ego stroked. Besides, winning would help me feel better. I'd get to taunt him for a change. I wait for him to get a little further ahead and out of sight, and then take a breath. I think back, recalling da Aaron's training exercises for my youth. I exhale. I try to clear my mind, 
but it's still chaotic. There's no just letting harsh words spill away like water, as he's fond of saying. My feelings are sore, attempting concentration in this frame of mind isn't wise. And yet, here I am about to throw caution to the wind. Just like Aaron said that I would. Everything reduces to two dueling thoughts. I am mad. I want nothing more to do with him. I am sad because I do. Reconciling them right now feels impossible. It's a choice mired in a mix of different competing anxieties, sinking into stagnation or drowning in the unknown. I feel alone on an island of misery. Stuck. But there was a time that I didn't feel this way. I remember our camping trips long before we came to the city. When I close my eyes, I can still hear Aaron's steady voice, smell the Ryan forest on warm summer air, and feel the flickering heat of our campfire. These were quieter times before the arguments, when his words helped me feel calm, supported, and safe. Times where he taught me to shape my own power, make my own choices. Times when I felt that he loved me without question. I focus on that. Still the mind. Slow the breath. Feel your surroundings. I feel the metal beneath my hands, the cold of the hissing air, the taste of the frost. Expand your perceptions. I picture the ladder's rungs. I hear the creaking of the bolts. I know there's metal beams above and below. Crumbling stone and mortar. There was a bridge once. I saw where it was attached. Beneath me, there was another building, close, but too far to jump. I saw crumpled stairs inside leading up. Good, Ravi, but more. Remember your perception is your reality. If this isn't the reality that you want, change it. Enter the story time. I take one last breath and then open my eyes. Reality and color shift. I'm still here on the ladder, but I can perceive both the ladder as it is and as it was. Electrical lights glare, neon flashes of signs and billboards, the ghosts of the people who lived here march below and above me. Everything has a digital aura, as if it were all might suddenly dissolve into pixels and fade away. I feel like a voyeur to the past, peering into something that I shouldn't. Something long gone. But it feels real. I smell exhaust, urine in the alley, bread baking in a restaurant nearby. I can hear snippets of conversation, too many conversations. Music, vehicles, sirens, sounds, smells, senses. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It's so loud. Overwhelming. Fuck, I can't do this. I'm too uneven. I'm losing focus. This was a mistake. I'm going to black out. Ra... Ravi. Come back, Ravi. Focus only on the threads you need. Right. Thanks, Dad. Ladder. Bridge. Stairs. I let everything else fade. Now spin them together. This is your story. Take control. I see the bridge both broken and whole. The ladder was secure. Ravi could climb it easily. I take another breath and pull myself to the next rung, and then the next. Oxygen fills my lungs. It's less of a struggle than before. I huff as I pull myself to the landing, making it a point not to look down. I open a door that is and isn't there, turn a corner and dodge a few insubstantial figures. The bridge hovers before me, flickering between being and unbeing. The bridge was whole. Ravi could cross it. The flickering stops. I step into open air, and my foot thuds on the bridge's translucent floor. I quickly cross it. I am always nervous just how real these stories will be, or how long that they might last. The other building's stairwell is on the left. I drag my gloved fingers across a wall that is both whole and nothing but skeletal rebar. 
Then I dash in. The stairs were all there, solid. They held when Ravi climbed them. I take step after step and my lungs burn. I probably should have said something about having better lung capacity this time, too. But maintaining my focus was troublesome enough. Remember, you are not safe in story time. Be focused and specific, then leave. Uneasiness. I feel that very suddenly. I've never experienced anything bad in story time, but never felt a dad was lying. He lied about a lot of things, but this? There's always something lurking, watching. I simply assumed it was the ghosts of the past, but... I sprint the rest of the way up the stairs, tumbling against the door of the stairwell as I try to catch my breath. I have to hurry. I shoulder the door open, jogging to the nearby windows. No bridge here, but that's not really a problem. There was a second, higher bridge with open exits. A spectral neon bridge appears, as if it's always been there. But my uneasiness increases. There is a difference between speaking something into being that once existed and creating something new. The latter feels like a ripple or an echo, a disturbance in the fabric of story time. My focus falters. Like a light breeze whispering against my ear, the pressure begins to change. It filters into my thoughts like a thousand pinpricks and just as many voices, expectant, eager, urging me to do more. Create more. Hungry. I glance over my shoulder, past the drifting shadows of the long dead, into a bright hallway that wasn't there before. Icicles hang before it like teeth. It feels different than the rest of story time. There's no digital aurora. It feels real. Powder and dust glide across its floor in a respired rhythm. It breathes. Listen. Something reaches for me, slithering like a tongue. It disturbs the shadows as if they were smoke, straining and stretching to close the distance. It's cold. Colder than it should be. Which is when I realize that I'm frozen, too. Come. Here. No. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. My heart pounds. My mind races. Yes, my mind. Distance in story time is more than just a matter of space. Thought is form. Ravi's too far. I say it again. I recite it like a mantra. Ravi's too far. Ravi's too far. It doesn't like that. The lights get brighter, and a sudden series of pops and crashes like ice on ice vibrates the room and my skull. I squeeze my eyes shut. The floor is shaking. Something slithers into my mind, hissing a word that I can't quite. Focus. I open my eyes. The hallway looms over me with its icy teeth, yawning open to breathe me in. A terrified gasp catches in my throat. You are in control. I summon everything that I can to scream past my terror. Ravi could not be caught. My body crackles with sudden energy. I immediately spin around, thundering across the new bridge back to the first building. I've never run so fast. Almost there. I try to stop myself but lose control, tripping over my own feet and tumbling forward. I slide across the rough cement floor and thump against the wall, a heap of insulated leather and glowing thermal protection. But my voice still works. The bridge Ravi Cross never existed. And then the bridge is gone. The monstrous hallway is gone. All I hear are the muted sounds of the city. I'm panting. My heart is pounding. I close my eyes. Get a grip, Ravi. I open my eyes. No hungry hallway. I push myself up against the wall, catching my breath. I'm in a large room. The remains of the furniture are scattered around, probably an old lounge. There are stairs leading up to the roof behind a ruined door. Good. I can do the rest on my own. Time to go. I take one final breath and close my eyes, thinking of the wind, the desolation, the ruins. Of Kavir, his handsome face and expansive ego his kindness for cheering me up 
on a bad day. Conclude the story. Come home, Ravi. I will, Dad. I will. I open my eyes and the story ends. I'm back. Back, but not okay. I'm still winded and flushed with adrenaline. Just what happened? I've never been threatened in story time before. I palm and rub my face. The holographic thermal barrier shimmers as my hand passes through it. I need to calm down and get my shit together. Even if it means losing to Kavir. I cross my legs to just be and close my eyes, attempting to meditate against the wall. I briefly wonder if Dad might have any more sage advice, but dismiss the thought. My anxiety would just return to where it was. No, I need clarity, and Dad's usually the opposite of that. But there is someone else who can help. I take a breath and clear my mind. Pay attention, child. Eurylis? Vakan, accent is full of roaring R's and open vowels. Please stop calling me that. You'll earn that right when you prove it's no longer true. Defend yourself. Lifting her practice baton, Eureli moves with grace and precision. She strikes high. I lift my baton to block. She knees me in the stomach and pushes me back. Sloppy. She circles me like a predator, noting every stray movement, every uneven breath. She strikes again. I block, barely dodging a follow-up swipe. You're reacting, not thinking. And you're relentless. Ow. I've rubbed my stomach. She lunges. Shit. I sidestep and counterattack. She swats the attack aside easily. Better, but you're still missing the point of this lesson. You mean it isn't a test on how many bruises that I can take? Too slow. I yelp, rubbing the spot. Yeesh. I am not training you to be a warrior. I am training you to think like one. She points to my eyes. Observe. Then to my head. Consider. Then to my hands. Execute. She then gestures over my entire body. A consistency of self allows for a unity of purpose. You sound like Dad. Because despite his abundant faults, your father understands the importance of being present. She lunges. This time I dodge out of range. Unfortunately for me, Yurali predicts the movement and rushes into my space whacking my wrist and forcing me to drop the baton. Briskly, she grabs my disarmed hand and locks it against my back. I hiss. You are not here. She speaks evenly into my ear. I can feel her breath. Where are you? Where am I? I'm fucking trapped in a joint lock, Yuri. No. She tightens the lock. My arm buckles. I wince and fall to a knee. I struggle a little to try and break the lock, which only results in further pain. Fuck. Because it is so simple, it eludes even the keenest of minds. If you already know the knife is sharp, then you were cut by it a long time ago. You're really reciting a scripture to me right now? She ignores me. Do not become caught by the moment of struggle. If you choose to make it your home, then you will never leave. Her voice is low, cold, and smooth. I don't sense any anger or ego. She repeats herself. Where are you? Her calm stoicism is like an aura. It focuses me as well. I take a breath and think. I'm trapped. I'm caught. I'm stuck. Oh. I'm stuck. Yes. But not physically. Well, yes physically, but also in my head. Yes. So, because I believe that I am stuck, I am stuck. She loosens her grip slightly. The world is vast, and we are so small. We do not grow in size when our eyes are closed. If you open your eyes and the room is full, 
Then when you close your eyes, the room is still full. This one I understand. I've got to get out of my head. Assume nothing. Focus on the present. Observe. I take a slow breath, relaxing my limbs to twist and break the joint lock. Just like she's shown me many times before. Urali nods. Now, how sharp is the knife? Consider. Not sharp enough. Execute. I'm startled by the sound of heavy paw pads landing in front of me, the blood briefly draining from my face. There you are. Ravi, did I just see you walking across open air? And was that you yelling? The fuck? Shit. I, uh... I use the wall to push myself back up to my feet. Dad would say something like, never let people get too close, and conjure a story of the so absurd that it must be true variety. Kavir and I already are way past the former, and I'm definitely not clever enough for the latter. Besides, I don't want to push Kavir away. You, uh, what? What aren't you telling me? I think back to Yuri's lesson instead. I feel a wash of calm from the memory, swallowing my fear as I observe Kavir's face. He seems confused, not worried, so he probably hasn't jumped to any threatening conclusions. That makes sense. Kavir's a pretty grounded guy, and I've always been the more anxious of the two of us. Except when I'm mad. I guess as I stand at the top of the crumbling high-rise with no climbing gear. Maybe I am reactionary and irresponsible. Ow! Kavir interrupts my thoughts by thumping my head. Frosty atmosphere to Ravi. Hey, sometime before I freeze? Alright, alright. I came across some new jazz tech, and I just surprised myself a bit. Kavir groans. I knew it. You only challenged me to a race because you had some new gadget up your sleeve the whole time. I'm not fond of lying to Kavir, even if it was only a half lie. Because I do have a lot of new gadgets, just not on me, and not for this race. Which, in hindsight, would have been smart. I can't always rely on story time for emergencies, especially not with today's surprises. I resist a shiver. As if I could beat you without some kind of an edge. Which is true. And you're not gonna show me or tell me anything about it, are you? Nope. I grin brightly. Not yet, anyways. Sneaky shit. Fine. He lifts up his hands. I surrender. You win. What? Just like that? Hey, honestly or no, you beat me up here and just a few steps shy at the top. I'll take the L, but just this time. Honest? Hmm. I fold my arms and look away for a moment. He gently knuckles me in the chest, stepping back into my vision. His big hand grasps my shoulder. Why the frown? Ain't winning what you wanted. He eyes the stairs leading up to the building's roof. Come on, I'm not a complete idiot. I know you really wanted someone to talk to. It's my turn to look surprised. How uncharacteristically intuitive of you. The snow tiger shrugs his broad shoulders and swishes his tail as he walks past me, the yellow sash he always keeps tied to it, nearly flicking my nose. I can't let you hog all the surprises, Grumplin. The bottom of the stairwell is dark. Kavir's tail baps me on the nose, and I grab it. I can barely make out his grinning face. Don't fall now. The stairs protest, but hold. As we approach the top, darkness quickly gives way to light. The door to the roof has long since disintegrated, with light pouring in so bright, even my hollow mask doesn't shade quickly enough. For a moment, I mistake the wind for a voice. My breath catches in my throat. But there's no spooky hallway, just the roof and Kavir. I exhale, squinting as I join him. He slides an arm around my shoulders as I do. The ruined city of Sen Leos is extensive. Essentially circular, the tallest buildings crowd in the middle and shorten the further out one goes, 
eventually fading into endless snow whipped up into dunes. I've only seen the ocean a few times in my life, but this always feels similar. The occasional cluster of ruined buildings or islands can be seen far out amidst the white, surrounded by hoary, foggy waves frozen in time. As the very tips of the taller buildings, they hint at much more buried beneath powder and permafrost. So much more. An entire industry exists to explore it, provided one can get approval, or not, if one wishes to live dangerously. Well, more dangerously. Kavir prefers the legal side of danger, at least when it comes to ruineering. Hence, his business, Kavir's expeditions at Enterprises, stitched on the back of his shoulder harness as K-E-N-E. -E. I'll never get used to this view. Even after living here all your life? What you mean? Well, it's just white on white with few embellishments. There's not that much to see. But there is. Don't go be a nearsighted city boy. It might just seem like endless snowfields, but the land here breathes. It changes. Between the winds and the snow, the jazz energy and whatever other natural forces are to work, you'll never see the same landscape twice. Well, in a mechanical sense, I suppose that's true, since the dunes are always moving. But even so, it always looks pretty similar to me. Cold. Frozen. It's just... a lot of white. So am I. And you like me well enough. This guy. You're more blue than white. And I didn't say that I hated it. I know. But what about the beauty of it? It's just that everyone calls it the white. Like it's some kind of phantom waiting to make you disappear. Isn't it though? People vanish out there all the time. Kavir shakes his head. Past the city skyline, low clouds swirl along all the visible horizon, white and gray blurring along an indistinct terminus. Bearing the occasional building or rock, that subtle distinction in color is the only way of knowing where snowfields end and sky begins. It strains my eyes. People vanish because they're unprepared. They don't respect that you can't tame a landscape like this. You either act humble or are humbled by it. Humble? Hmm? I elbow his side, but his hands find my shoulders again as he looks down at me. I'm serious. Yeah, it's kind of freaking me out a little. He chuckles. Sorry, it's just something that's been on my mind is all. But I don't mean to make this about me. We're up here for you. He squeezes my shoulder. It's okay, Frost Fuzz. I can wait a little longer. What happened? He doesn't answer immediately. He sighs. Another ship's gone missing. The Midnight Star. I heard about it right before you called. The navigator's a good woman named Adeline. We've done some jobs together. I pat his head. You think that this is related to that big storm a few days ago? Probably. I'm sorry, were you close? Not personally, but that's not what this is about. Being a ruiner is dangerous work, Ravi. You know, charting new locations and exploring who knows what. So all of us involved, sailors and adventurers, mechanics and the like, we all have a sort of professional understanding, even if we're competing for the same stake. Like, a kind of family? I wouldn't go that far. But there is a certain amount of mutual respect. We listen to each other, because if we don't, people die out there. So what's the problem? Well, the reports all said normal overcast that day, but the readouts all had this storm tracking north, right? Jastic is pretty incredible stuff, but it doesn't always get the details right, especially when it comes to weather. Which, considering we're working with tech that's hundreds of years old, it's understandable. So what? You're saying that this shouldn't have happened? 
It's not common to lose expeditions to bad reports, but it's not unheard of. More the problem is that I knew that it was wrong. I felt it, and I told Adeline to tell her captain to. Wait, back up. You felt it? Your tail have a built-in barometer or something now? That what this sash is? I swatted it playfully. Kavir sighs and looks away, even his tail droops. The captain didn't believe me either. Superstitious nonsense, he told Adeline. Even with the understanding that there's a reason why you don't see many snow tigers around the docks, folks don't put much stock in our feelings. Well, stall your claws, Fuzzy. I didn't say that I don't believe you or your entire people. I just need a little more than it felt wrong. I knew it because I could tell Kwethwechnotu was upset about something. Kwethwechnotu? Kwethwechnotu? He takes a breath and pinches the bridge of his nose. It's not something that we talk a whole lot about outside of our clans. Well, okay. I don't know how helpful you expect me to be if it just sounds like you're making up words. I'm not from here, Kavir. I don't hold any weird prejudice against anyone. Prejudices that aren't deserved anyways. Kavir sighs again. <sighs> People around here live by their tech, Ravi. They don't got much room in their heads for a whole lot else. Being as you're a tech head too, I just thought that you might feel kind of similar. This is turning into a deeper conversation than I expected. I look around for a place to sit near the building's edge that appears relatively stable. I eventually find a large metal beam that somehow doesn't seem to have damaged the floor too much when it fell. Good construction, I guess. I know that we agreed a while back not to talk too deeply about our pasts, Kavir, but maybe that ought to have changed? Sit with me. I can't feel Dad's disapproval in spirit, and I don't care. I sit, gesturing for Kavir to join me. He does, returning his arm to my shoulders and pulling my bundled body into his side. I feel his warmth less than I'd like to. We simply sit there in quiet for a few moments, snuggling together against the cold. Spirituality is everywhere back home. Like you, I don't like to talk about it a whole lot. But Ryan is a place where the people say everything that has a story has a voice. If you annoy a familiar rock or a tree or river by talking to it long and hard enough, it'll eventually talk back. I smile as I look out at the horizon, warm but bittersweet. And up in Vakas, the Shradhazwar capital, they have a whole institution dedicated to the philosophy of the soul. Temples and chanting and scriptures. Where do you think Yurali gets it all? I reckon that I knew that already. She's pretty on the nose about her faith. But you, Ravi, you never seem to take much stock in it. Well, I don't. Not really. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some value to it. Bruises aside. I look back at him. The snow tiger hums. Aside from a few sacred places where the jazz is rich, Snow tigers mostly roam the snowfields in family clans, following the Klechen herds. Do that long enough and you're bound to get to know a place. He taps his head. So trust me when I say what folks call the white is Kwethwento. Her name means something like the bright wind or the shining breath. She's in the land the air and the jazz. A certain bizarre hallway suddenly springs to mind. Uh, how bright? I lift a hand. No, never mind. What kind of, uh, spirit is she? She's not a spirit. He rubs at his cheek. Well, not in the sense that she's metaphorical or nothing. She's energy. She's real. As in, she's someone that you can talk to? No. But when you're far out, deep in the jazz, you can feel her. We call her the Great Grandmother. 
She has patterns and routines that she likes, as well as moods that you've got to manage. Especially when her routines get all out of sorts, usually from outside interference. She gets real cranky then. Sounds like a spirit, Kavir. And that's what you felt a few days ago? Yeah, something was off. I could feel it in my spots and stripes. He reaches for his tail with his free hand, gently thumbing at the yellow sash. That's what I was trying to get out earlier. Adeline trusts what I had to say, but the Midnight's captain didn't. It was bad form. Now word on the docks is that he was being pressured by the company to investigate something, and if he messed it up, they'd take the ship. So it probably wasn't personal, but even so, no ship is worth its crew. He shakes his head. It just feels so unnecessary. The great grandmother doesn't care a whit about the company or its schedules. If he had just waited a day, things would be fine. He looks up at the sky. Well, I'm at least sorry about Adeline. It sounds like she was pressured to go too, even if she thought that it was a bad idea. Well, I wouldn't call her out just yet. She's no snow tiger, but she's been navigating these lands for a long time. She understands the rules, respect the great grandmother, listen to her songs, and follow her lead when you dance. Do that, and she'll show you all kinds of wonders. Maybe even a safe harbor or two. Hmm, I never took you for much of a dancer. Is that what you're doing whenever you're bouncing around these buildings or sailing around in powder ships? Dancing to snow music? Maybe I am. Is that so hard to imagine? I just smile at him. Besides, ain't your rally on all the time about listening to the emptiness and looking beyond the surface? Or whatever piece of scripture that she's married to today? This is exactly why she doesn't like you. Impossible. I just haven't turned on the charm yet. Besides, I respect her faith. It just sounds funny sometimes. Yeah, I don't think that's going to win her over. Besides, I think she's only capable of liking two or three people at a time. I can be the third. Sure. But you wanted to talk, and I made this all about me. So let me guess. Aaron, huh? I'm not really sure that I need to vent about Dad anymore, but it's probably for the best if Kavir's filled in. He doesn't want me calling him Dad anymore. Well, you can always call me, stopping you right there. If you want to talk, you'd say. Kavir laughs, the deep sound echoing off the building and probably down into the streets below. I smiled in spite of myself. It's a nice change of pace. Seriously though, what instigated this? I roll my eyes. You did. Huh? Oh. He chuckles. I guess the invitation to join the crew didn't go over so well, then. Shockingly, no. Well, you expected there to be some pushback. I sigh. Maybe even that was too optimistic. Well, golly gee, how dare you make attempts at independence? Okay, well, how did Yorali take it? Quietly. Okay, so... That's like, her natural state of being. Oh, no. I flick my hands out towards the snowy wastes. Like your great-grandmother out there, her quiet has an entire spectrum of moods. So, this was a disapproving sort of quiet, then? Like I said, she doesn't like you. Hmm. Well, even if she's not the biggest fan of my work, I know Aaron likes me. I laugh a bit bitterly. I'm sure he does, in the same way that he pretends to like everyone. Whoa there, Grumplin. First of all, I'm impossible to dislike unless you were a beleaguered captain or a warrior nun made of salt and iron shavings. Second, you need to be more up. We're at one of the highest points in the city, and I need you to get with the ambience. What, frozen and windswept? And weren't you just Mr. Melancholy like three seconds ago? Couldn't say. Bad memory. 
Shifting his weight, the big snow tiger reaches over his free hand to tap the earpiece control of my mask, the translucent material fading to neon pixels that crumble into nothing. My face is suddenly very cold. The fur of his knuckles drags down and tickles the side of my cheek. But it's not enough. I urge him to cup my cheek instead, and our fingers entangling. Vapor spills and swirls between us as he gently rests his forehead against mine. Tell me, what do you want, Ravi of the Ryan? I close my eyes. Now I can feel his warmth. I just want to be free, you know. Of more than Kavir could possibly know. To live my life without restrictions. He slides both arms around me and presses his face closer. His breath. His strength. Then be free. Simple as that, huh? Observe. Consider. I exhale shakily. Our faces are still close when I open my eyes and our gazes meet. Kavir's eyes have a golden brightness, distinct from the chilly coloring of his fur. Your eyes are like the color of the sun. Are they? I guess you know the best, being from a land where the sun ain't constantly in bed. He slowly pulls away and looks up, shading his eyes. Maybe I'll see this Ryan of yours someday? Maybe. Though you'd probably overheat. I'd overheat anywhere that don't have constant snow. He drops his hands and thumbs his chest. I'm all fur, muscle, and antifreeze. No room for brains, huh? Nah, I'll just take yours. Come here. He hooks his arm around my head, squeezing me between his biceps and his chest. I'm forced to breathe him in. He smells fresh and cool, just like him, him a mint. Why do you smell like you're rolling around in a mountain garden? Do you like it? It's an odd combination of the distinct and familiar. I associate so much of this place with Kavir, but Himavent fills the Shrad Haswar Highlands. It's nice. I thought that it might help you feel better. Maybe remind you of home? His fur tickles my nose. Sometimes the Highland breezes would swirl so thickly with the scent that it would get all caught up in my sinuses and make me sneeze. There was really no escaping it for all the time that we hid up there. Aaron, Urali, and me back before we fled to the west. How long was it? Just the three of us? We were so messy and complicated, and I was so often angry or afraid, I remember running away again and again. I breathe in Kavir. I'd always hide in the mint fields. Yeah. I smile. Again and again, they'd find me. That's where we'd always figure things out. I'm definitely going to sneeze. It does. I elbow Kavir in the stomach. He grunts, but releases me with a little smirk. What? Not in the mood today? The tingling fades and I thoughtfully rub my nose. Yuri's words still echoed in my head. It's time to figure things out. Just bad timing. I should be getting back. Oh. I guess. I leaned forward. His face fuzz is soft against my lips. Thank you. I tap my earpiece. The holographic barrier glows into being, immediately warming my face, but not more than Kavir's fur. Don't sound so glum. I'm still joining your crew. Yeah? His ears perk. Yeah. I just think that I should follow up back home, you know? Make an attempt at repairing things a bit, if I need to. Whatever our disagreement and flaws, I obviously care too much about both Dad and Yurali to let things stay awkward forever. I probably overreacted. You? Never. Careful, pretty boy. And to think that I could have had you saying that all afternoon. I groan. In any case, I can get you home quickly enough. It just so happens that I have a contact in the club tonight who you'll need to meet eventually anyway, so why not now? Oh, who? What kind of contact? He shakes his head. I can't say. Then what? You want me to find them through mind reading? 
I place my fingers to my temples and make a face. We both know the real reason that I asked you to join my company, Ravi. Yeah, jazz running. What about it? Well, names are dangerous. The distinction between my legit expedition work as K-E-N-E -N -E, and the jazz running crew exists for that reason. We don't have to hide who we are to go out into the white. But if we're talking runner jobs in town? Doing merc work invites unsexy attention, is all. You're Elise's favorite. True. Listen, I've worked with jazz runners before, Kabir. I know the risks. I thought that we already had this understanding. Where do you think that I get most of the tech clients? They're runners or tech punks. Usually both. I know, I know. I just want to make sure that you realize what I'm asking. Having you along with the K and E expeditions will be nice, but that's a secondary perk. The jazz running crew needs a tech head for the jobs that we got brewing, so that's what I really need. But I gotta make sure that this one last time that you know what you're getting into. I'm aware you moonlight as a filthy thief, Kavir. This isn't news. Excuse you, I am a dashing ruiner and relic acquisitor by day, jazz running treasure hunter by night. I think you can only call yourself a treasure hunter if you're taking from the dead. I fold my arms. Well, they're dead inside. I roll my eyes. Like my patience. Come on, I wouldn't have drummed up all this family drama if I wasn't serious. As far as Dad and Yuri are concerned, I'm joining KE&E, -E, which is true. I'm also here to be a jazz runner, which of course, I won't tell them because then they'll really freak out. I exhale sharply. So yeah, I know what's what. Kavir nods. Okay. So now that we've cleared this up, why can't I get a name? Not even an alias? I just have to be delicate about naming people is all. Even aliases have power. You'll figure out who it is, I promise. He thinks for a moment. Just be discreet and listen. I squint. Do you even know what those words mean? Besides, we're literally alone on a ruined skyscraper. How much more remote do we need to be for shady talk? Much. But hey, I'm the successful businessman here. Just trust me, okay? I drop my arms and make a long, suffering sound. And I'm the tech head. There's no way anyone would be spying on us up here short of some kind of stealth drone. Those things exist? Kale, preserve me. Not in your financial universe. I pinch the bridge of my nose. But fine. Do you have an alias? Yes. I wait. And it is... I feel like this is the minimum that I should know before meeting a mysterious contact and spilling the beans on your actual name. Please don't tell me that I know your real name and not your alias. It's not that. Kavir. Ugh, fine. It's Nightlight. I cough. Nightlight? Like the thing, little kids? I didn't choose it. The snow tiger swats my rear with enough force that I hobble. Hey! It's just that my eyes and the fur pattern can fluoresce a bit, okay? It makes sense when you're out in the white at night surrounded by jazz energies and need to blend in. I had a job once where I got noticed and the damn name stuck. How did I not know this about you? Kavir just grins. With you being on the jazz running crew, you'll be learning plenty more about me soon enough. Forward. He crouches down in front of me and gestures for me to climb on his back. You'll be needing to think of a name too. Try to keep Ravi to yourself, alright? That said, tonight's contact already knows who you are, so you got time to think on it. Is that safe? Me already being known? Trust me, you'll be hard pressed keeping it secret in this case, but you're not in any danger. Just play along with whatever they say. Think of it as a test. He points to his back again. I lift my brows. What? Are you going to carry me down? I said that I'd get you home quickly. 
all right, all right. I clamor onto him. I feel like the man has a back wide enough for two of me, which leaves ample space for me to climb on. Nightlight. I whisper against his ear. He stands as if I weigh nothing, tapping at his bracer. An electric surge flickers through his harness, synchronizing with the jazz lines of my jacket. A moment later, I'm energetically adhered to his back. Um... Is electro adhesion really necessary? I wiggle uncomfortably. Yes, because we're gonna jump. Excuse me? He tugs at his harness to make sure that I'm secure and then experimentally unsheaths his claws. Those things can slice into steel. It'll be faster. I've got that glider module that you made for me. Besides, if anything happens, you've got that fancy new piece of jazz tech that you used before to walk on air, right? It'll be fine. Oh, fuck. Uh, about that? Wait a second. That's not how it... He suddenly takes off towards the edge of the building, leaping into the empty space. I scream. Somewhere in the wind, I can hear him laughing. This guy, I swear. The air swirls as we hurtle towards a roof much further down. Hey! What? The air continues to roar past us. I'm gonna try that glider module now. What do you mean, try? Have you not tested it yet? I was waiting for a good time. Kavir, you're gonna kill us. Nah, you wouldn't lead me on about tech, right? You always make quality. Just hold tight. The dumb snow tiger waves his wrist, the jazz tech bracer glowing. Its yellow holographic interface crackles to life. Uh, how does this work again? My stomach threatens to leave my body. Kavir! With a bellow laugh swallowed by the wind, he taps the interface and suddenly we're jolted. Electric blues and purple flash. The jazz energies of the device flow wirelessly through Kavir's harness and sizzle a dazzling curtain into being above us, slowing our fall. But only for a moment. Wind buffets us, and suddenly the holographic curtain dissolves into pixels. What happened? The crosswinds are too strong. The snow tiger's heavy body hits the roof at an angle, and he rolls forward. My entire body trembles with the impact. The air is knocked out of my lungs. I bury my face against his shoulder and cling to him with everything that I have. Hang on! No shit. All I feel is speed and motion. I lift my face just as Kavir hops over the roof's lips and swings through a lower, broken window. The floors here have disintegrated, but that doesn't seem to stop him. I feel the blood empty from my face as he runs straight to the edge and dives into the abyss. I want to scream, but my lungs are still empty. A lower floor whooshes past us, and then another. He opens his arms wide as he plummet. How are you feeling? He yells. He has to. The whipping air is thunderous. I try to suck in and choke. Save that for later. His bracer interface flares to life again, and that familiar light flickers above us. On and off. We jolt as our momentum is suddenly arrested, and we're tossed towards a metal support pillar. Claws out, Kavir latches onto it. The metal screeches as it breaks down its length. You're strangling me, Grumplin. You need to relax. Let me show you something. With legs like coiled springs, he violently leaps from the pillar. We sail out another broken window, and for a moment, we fly. In the cold void between buildings, time and gravity disappear. I feel lighter, weightless, free. My eyes begin to sting. In that moment of clarity, I finally remember how to breathe. Is this? Kavir's voice is clear, like a bell ringing through morning fog. Freedom! Physics then come rushing back. We plummet towards the earth, Kavir's arms outstretch as if to embrace the ground. Don't worry, I also cried my first time. His laughing surrounds us. I'm not crying. I'm laughing too, diaphragm deep, 
soul-shattering sobs of laughter. Then how about you stop sobbing into my neck fur? No. The curtain again comes alive, and we angle towards a smaller building across the alley. I purposefully keep my face shoved into Kavir's fur, shielding my wind-dried eyes and gathering my wits. Holding on feels easier now. A swing of his legs, a tap of his wrist, and the curtain dissolves just as we lurch towards a wall. Kavir latches onto it with his claws, only to immediately leap from it. We repeat the same stunt a few more times. Leap, float, drop, leap, float, drop, but always only for short bursts. It smells like showing off. But maybe. Ha ha! Yeah! Woo! Maybe it's simply joy. He glides into the clear section of a nearby alley, protected from the crosswinds. The electrical curtain fades as his paw sinks into the snow. You really enjoyed that, huh? I rub my swollen eye. Always. He taps at his bracer a final time, and with the brief surge of energy, I'm released from his harness. Show off. I box one of his ears. Do I at least get a kiss for it? I make an exasperated noise. Your Riley would be proud of, but don't actually slide off his back. If he wants to perform, he can run me home, too. Take me to the club, you lug. I kiss the back of his head for the trouble. Love you too. Running in the cold is natural for Kavir, even with me on his back. I find the rhythm of his gait meditative, the gentle bobbing against his back comforting. It gives me time to look around and simply enjoy the peace of the moment. I breathe in the cold scent of his fur as I ride. It doesn't take long for us to wind our way through the alley and rubble back to the main thoroughfare. I read some of the road signs as we go, broken and leaning in odd directions, but still legible. Corporate Square and Landon Avenue, to name a few. This road was called Landing Day Boulevard. Now it's just the Port Road. As we jog further away from the street center, the buildings we pass become smaller and more stable, and less tightly spaced. Through the gaps between them, I catch glimpses of docked powder ships against the backdrop of the white's endless expanse. Maybe it's the desert heat in my blood, but I still find it surprising that topside San Leos remains as active as it is. The remnants of the old downtown might be an icy crypt, but life along the edge of the city persists, however fragile. I look back to the road. Jazz lines in the asphalt keep it warm enough to melt the snow. Colorful lights and neon signs buzz in the waning light. We dash past groups of off-shift dock workers and ruiners hopping between bars. They mingle, but there's a clear distinction between them. The workers are weighed down in heavy cold weather gear, but the ruiners wear the lighter and more expensive tech warmed stuff, like my own jacket. Their gear glows dimly, like candle flames at a distance that could be easily snuffed out. I look over Kavir's shoulder. The only light on him is the glow from his bracer. It's like traces through the air as his arms move. I'm reminded of the last message that he sent while out on expedition. This new bracer you made is great. Interface is way better than the last model. I can't wait to have you upgraded with that special glider doohickey that you mentioned. As for here, I sent you some pictures of the dig. I know my exceptional skill and talent makes the work look easy, because it is, for me. He laughed. But truth, Talon, it's dangerous work, Robbie. We almost lost two men today to shift in ice, and someone broke their leg yesterday thanks to falling debris. I know I've said jazz runnings where I really need a tech head. But the line between life and death out here can be pretty thin, too. A kind soul with the right skill and cleverness could make a real difference. Someone like you. Just think about it. The glare of the bright lights jar me from the thought, some banged up transport hovercraft speeding past us, a bunch of Felix holocycles with jazzed up wheels follow along behind it. High end. Must be some valuable jazz tech with an escort like that, probably fresh off the boat with who knows how many ruiners harmed in its discovery. My fingers grip Kavir's fur. 
the city lifeblood, the machine of commerce. The only place in this world where tech can still be found like this, surrounded by people trained in its use. People like me. The thought rolls in my gut. You okay back there? You got all clingy for a sec. I grip his fur a little more. Kavir, you really like being a ruiner, right? Weird question. You sure you're okay? Of course I like it. Why? Lots of reasons. It's profitable. It's exciting. You know I live for danger. That doesn't really scare you at all. The danger? Now, don't be getting second thoughts on me now, especially after everything that you just did. Mr. Climbs without gear. This isn't about me. Well, ain't you just all sorts of off? This ain't grumpling behavior at all. Being so forethoughtful and saccharine. I flick his ear. So you weren't scared then? Sure I am. All the time. Out there. He gestures towards the white. But excitement and fear ain't so different. Listen, being a good ruiner means embracing that feeling. The adrenaline. It's a call to action, but also a reminder that you can't always be perfectly in control. It keeps you alert, but also honest. Humble. He mentioned that before. I guess he really means it. Humble, huh? Well, humble where it counts. Hmm. So that dramatic leap out the window? Sometimes it's freeing to feel a little untethered. Maybe. I certainly felt something. Well, terrorizing me aside, do you like the new upgrades? I admit that's not really how I intended you to use it, but it works. You kidding? Why do you think that I want you to join the crew so bad? I already knew that you had the right stuff, but when I showed the others that you could fabricate a glider module, they were damned impressed. I squint. That implies that you already had tested it out. Of course I did. I'm actually going to bite you. Oh, Grumplin's back. Please do. Suddenly his demeanor changes as we approach a customs office. He dashes down a side street. I stare for a second and then glance behind us. His senses are much sharper than mine, so it's normal for me to play catch up in moments like this. There's nothing particularly special about the building itself, though there are company guards stationed outside. That's normal. However, their ceremonial dark suits and holographic shades mark them as Coordin's special agents. Soldiers working directly for the office of the chairman. I'd worked on the hardware for some of those shades discreetly in the past. They're no joke. Multispectral sensors picking up and recording pretty much everything. There's also the intimidating CWS Jazz Magnums attached to their hips. Those punch through anything. Still, it isn't uncommon for them to be around when important materials or technologies are traded. I wonder if that escorted transport is related. I turn back towards Kavir. Coordinates guy spook you? Something going on? Nah, just being cautious. I mentioned before the jobs that we got lined up, and I don't need them harassing me again. Again? I'll tell you later. It's just running stuff. I frown. You're not trying to get tech for the shrad, are you? Kavir snorts. I'm a mercenary, not a madman. Salvaging and creative liberation of goods is one thing, but high treason? He shakes his head. No adventure's worth that. I believe him. There are a lot of reasons not to get involved in that business. Even Dad stays out of it, and he would know. The Cold War is why we left, after all. Safety within the enemy of your enemy. Okay. We round a corner and can see the club down the street. Kavir stops to let me disembark. Yep, it's a boat. I'm good from here. Hey! He crouches to eye level, resting a hand on my shoulder. Even if you weren't interested in joining the crew, or going out on expeditions, you know I've always got your back, right? I tilt my head. Of course, why? I just know it's a lot. All the stuff from today. Family can be hard. 
I'm here, not roaming with my folks for a lot of the same reasons. I pat his head. I'll figure it out. So will you. He grins. So will we. But one last thing. He takes a breath. I'm not blind. I know you worry about me, so listen. I need you to put that aside, because if you want to do these things with me, it can't be because you want to do them for me. The work's too dangerous for that. Trying to focus on your own safety and mine at the same time means that you'll get neither. This is something that you have to want for yourself. Do you understand me? I do, I promise. All right. Just know that I wouldn't have asked if I didn't believe in you. He taps my ear pierce again to dissolve the visor and then leans in to kiss my temple. He lingers for a minute before pulling away. If you need anything, just let me know. I clear my throat, flushing from head to toe. Well, now that you mention it, there is this contact that I'm supposed to meet. Nope. He stands back and stretches. No cheating on this one. Figure it out. Ouch. Fair enough. Now I'm gonna go before Yurali senses me somehow. I thought that you were going to charm her. Already jogging away, he calls over his shoulder. I am. Later. Just soften her up for me. And then he dashes out of sight. I chuckle and watch him go, taking a breath to steal myself before turning and walking towards the well-maintained but largely unremarkable two-storied old world building. The only hint of its importance are multicolored mosaic lanterns dangling from suspended cables spanning the road and the telltale glow of neon signs. One of them hums and splashes its name over the door. The tail spinners are spite. My boots crunch as I ascend the familiar short flight of stairs. My fingers hover just above the access panel. Dad's club, my home. I exhale, no more avoiding it. Execute. To be continued. So, that was the first build of Zero String. Um... Hmm. I knew I could... I knew I recognized some of the music that was being used. Or at least some of the... What's the word? Hmm... Like... The... The tones of the music. Um... What else? I'm just reading the names here, in no particular order. <laughs> anyways, so... Ah, but anyways, I'm assuming again that this is the protagonist, and the tiger will be his... partner of sorts? Uh, because I mean... He gave him a kiss on the forehead, obviously. They are more than... just... friends. Uh... I really like the, the the menu music. Well, the whatever this music is, whatever you would call it. Ah, but thoughts. I don't know enough about this world, as with the most first builds, to be able to make any um, guesses as to what the story is going to be about or where it's going to go or whatever. Hmm. Uh... I'm assuming the story will take place in or around the area that they're at. Um, that it's wherever it is that they live is a frozen continent or it's not a planet, I'm assuming. Uh, actually, I'm not really sure, to be honest, but I'm assuming it's going to take place in this snowy area. Uh, I kind of like the tiger. The design is interesting. In fact, that's the only reason <laughs> that I decided to follow the story when it first announced itself on Twitter. Um, thoughts about a human protagonist? Well, fine, I guess. 
Um, I hope that it's not... Well, actually, no. From the beginning, you can tell that the story, that the protagonists it's, it's, are their own character. That this is not a self-insert type of story where you're going to be them. Uh, the protagonist has their own wants and needs and feelings, etc., etc. So that's good. That's something that I like about protagonists. Because, I mean, like, please don't make self-inserts anymore. Thankfully, this does not feel like that. Um, I like the whole thing about, like, the they have, like, holographic tech. I'm not exactly sure what it means with, like, um, whatever it is that I... it. I get the feeling that there is a sort of energy that is free-flowing, kind of. Um, that most of the technology in this story uh, is powered by, I'm assuming. Like the little visor thing that he has right here that's making the little cat ears. At least I think they're cat ears. Or is it like wolf ears? Because I, I, I could kind of see like a like a wolf muzzle and like these pointy ears are less cat, more canine-y. Um, I'm assuming the little, the, the back swoosh is a tail. We'll see. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Um, really, not much to say about it right now, I guess. Uh, I mean, if you guys have comments, you know, write it down in the comment section and we'll discuss it there. If the story reminds you of anything or... Well, yeah, if it reminds you of anything, or if you like it, if you if there's like certain elements of the story that you hope are um, expanded upon, like maybe the the energy or like the the type of like the earpiece thingy that they use. Um, it is interesting that they do have a sort of not religion, but um belief systems that kind of helps flesh out the the world more too because there is a belief system that belongs to the other crap i don't remember if it was a cat and the other one that belongs to the tiger i'm assuming the tiger is a native to well i mean he is native to the region but um that he is out of the current cast that we just saw the one that is native and everyone else is just sort of immigrants from a warmer continent? I don't know. I don't know if there's space travel yet. I don't know. I don't know where these people are from yet. Um, but yeah, you know, write down in the comments what you think so far. And thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play string zero or zero string. String zero. <laughs> Um, yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description for the Twitter page, which I will be linking down in the description, along with the Patreon, in case you want to support this new visual novel. Um, you know, it always helps these new creators when you support them, even if you just go to their Twitter page and tell like, hey, I really like your story, or even the HIO page. Um, you know, to tell like, hey, this story is really cool. I'm looking forward to, you know, where it leads to, etc., <laughs> etc. Et um, what's the little cloud thingy? I don't want to click it because I don't want to. Oh, the little cloud icon is a blue sky thing, so I'll probably link that too. I will not link the Discord one though, because um, that's. Uh, like, you don't just want random people joining the Discord. You know, just go look for the Discord yourself. Uh, but yeah. Uh, really not much else to say, and, uh, my coffee, you want to donate? It's down in the description. Come on. Donate to me. <laughs> it helps. Really, it does. Like, it really has helped. Like, uh, you guys have allowed me to do things that I would not normally have been able to do this year and be able to do something really special that, you know, the, the, the first initial me asking you to donate. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's it for now and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye.